The Armistice of Mudros, concluded on 30 October 1918, ended the hostilities. At noon the next day, in the Middle Eastern theatre between the Ottoman Empire and the Allies of World War I, it was signed by the Ottoman Minister of Marine Affairs Ralph Bay and the British Admiral Somerset Arthur Gough Calthorpe. On board HMS Agamemnon in Mordros Harbour on the Greek island of Lemnos, as part of several conditions to the armistice, the Ottomans surrendered their remaining garrisons outside Anatolia, as well as granted the Allies the right to occupy forts controlling the Straits of the Dardanelles and the Bosphorus, and the right to occupy the same. In case of disorder, any Ottoman territory in the event of a threat to their security, the Ottoman army including the Ottoman Air Force was demobilized, and all ports, railways, and other strategic points were made available for use by the Allies. In the Caucasus, the Ottomans had to retreat to within the pre-war borders between the Ottoman and the Russian empires. The armistice was followed by the occupation of Constantinople and the subsequent partitioning of the Ottoman Empire. The Treaty of Chevres which was signed in the aftermath of World War I was never ratified by the Ottoman Parliament in Istanbul. It was later superseded by the Treaty of Lausanne following the Turkish victory at the Turkish War of Independence which was conducted by the Grand National Assembly of Turkey in Ankara background. World War I took a chaotic turn in 1918 for the Ottoman Empire. In Syria, the Ottomans were steadily pushed back by the British over 1918, culminating in the fall of Damascus in October. However, the collapse of the Russian Empire allowed the Ottomans to regain ground in eastern Anatolia as the Russian armies deserted and even pushed into formerly Russian-controlled Caucasus with an all-Turkish army of Islam. The Caucasus campaign put the Ottomans at odds with their ally, Germany, which had been hoping to work with the new Soviet government and to buy the oil from the Caucasus oil fields. But the Ottomans wanted to continue to fight Russia and to take the oil for themselves. Still, the Turkish armies advanced far into Central Asia, gathering supporters as far away as Tashkent on the eastern side of the Caspian Sea. Additionally, with the change in the Russian government, chaos spread in Persia, as the Russo-British favoring government of Ahmad Shah Qajar lost authority outside of the capital. Hopes were initially high for the Ottomans that their losses in the Middle East might be compensated for by successes in Central Asia. Enver Pasha, one of the most influential members of the Ottoman government, maintained an optimistic stance hid information that made the Ottoman position appear weak, and led most of the Ottoman elite to believe that the war was still winnable. Developments in Southeast Europe quashed the Ottoman government's hopes. The Macedonian Front, also known as the Salonika Campaign, had been largely stable since 1916. In September 1918, the Allied forces mounted a sudden offensive which proved quite successful. The Bulgarian army was defeated, and Bulgaria was forced to sue for peace in the armistice of Salonika. That undermined both the German and Ottoman cause simultaneously. As the Germans had no troops to spare to defend Austria-Hungary from the newly formed vulnerability in southeastern Europe after the losses it had suffered in France, and the Ottomanis suddenly faced having to defend Constantinople against an overland European siege without help from the Bulgarians. Grand Vizier Talar Pasha visited Berlin, Germany, and Sofia, Bulgaria in September 1918. He came away with the understanding that the war was no longer winnable. With Germany likely seeking a separate peace, the Ottomans would be forced to do so as well. Talat convinced the other members of the ruling party that they must resign, as the Allies would impose far harsher terms if they thought the people who started the war were still in power. He also sought out the United States to see if he could surrender to them and gain the benefits of the 14 points despite the Ottoman Empire and 
the United States not being at war. However, the Americans never responded, as they were waiting on British advice as to how to respond that never came. On October 13, Talat and the rest of his ministry resigned. Ahmed Dizip Pasha replaced Talat as Grand Vizier. Two days after taking office, he sent the captured British General Charles Via Ferrer's Townshend to the Allies to seek terms on an armistice. Negotiations The British cabinet received word of the offer and were eager to negotiate a deal. The standing terms of the alliance was that the first member that was approached for an armistice should conduct the negotiations. The British government interpreted that to mean that Britain conduct the negotiations and alone. It is not entirely clear whether it was the sincere British interpretation of the alliance terms. Fears that the French would insist on over harsh demands and foil a treaty or a desire to cut the French out of territorial spoils promised to them. In the sykes pico agreement, Townshend also indicated that the Ottomans preferred to deal with the British. He did not know about the American contact or that Tallard had sent an emissary to the French as well but that emissary had been slower to respond back. The British cabinet empowered Admiral Calthorpe to conduct the negotiations with an explicit exclusion of the French from them. They also suggested an armistice rather than a full peace treaty, in the belief that a peace treaty would require the approval of all of the Allied nations and so be too slow. The negotiations began on Sunday, October 27 on the HMS Agamemnon, a British battleship. The British refused to admit French Vice Admiral Jean Francois Charles Armet, the senior French naval officer in the area. Despite his desire to join, the Ottoman delegation, headed by Minister of Marine Affairs Ralph Bay, indicated that it was acceptable as they were accredited only to the British, not the French. Both sides did not know that the other was actually quite eager to sign a deal and willing to give up their objectives to do so. The British delegation had been given a list of 24 demands but were told to concede on any of them except allowing the occupation of the forts on the Dardanelles as well as free passage through the Bosphorus. The British desired access to the Black Sea for the Romanian front. Prime Minister David Lloyd George also desired to make a deal quickly before the United States could step in, according to the diary of Morris. Hankey, Lord George, was also very contemptuous of President Wilson and anxious to arrange the division of Turkey between France, Italy, and GB. Before speaking to America, he also thought it would attract less attention to our enormous gains during the war if we swallowed our share of Turkey now, and the German colonies later. The Ottomans, for their part, believed the war to be lost and would have accepted almost any demands placed on them. As a result, the initial draft prepared by the British was accepted largely unchanged. The Ottomans did not know they could have pushed back on most of the clauses, and the British did not know they could have demanded even more. Still, the terms were largely pro-British and close to an outright surrender. The Ottomans ceded the rights to the Allies to occupy, in case of disorder, any Ottoman territory. A vague and broad clause. The French were displeased with the precedent. French Premier Georges Clemence, who disliked the British making unilateral decisions in so important a matter, Lord George countered that the French had concluded a similar armistice on short notice in the Armistice of Salonika, which had been negotiated by French General Despery and that Great Britain had committed the vast majority of troops to the campaign against the Ottomans. The French agreed to accept the matter as closed. The Ottoman educated public, however, was given misleadingly positive impressions of the severity of the terms of the armistice. It thought its terms were considerably more lenient than they actually were, a source of discontent later that the Allies had betrayed the offered terms during the Turkish War of Independence. Aftermath For a time, the armistice of Mudros brought hostilities to an end between the Allies and the Ottomans. However, incursions by the Italians and Greeks into Anatolia in the name of restoring order soon came close to an outright partition of the country.
The Treaty of Chevres in 1920 officially partitioned the Ottoman Empire into zones of influence. However, the Turkish War of Independence saw the rejection of the treaty by the remnant forces of the Ottomans who eventually took control of the Anatolian Peninsula. Ottoman holdings in Syria, Palestine, and Arabia stayed as distributed by the Treaty of Chevres while the modern nation of Turkey's borders were set by the Treaty of Lausanne in 1923. Literature Laura M. Adkis and Great Britain and the Kemalist Movement for Turkish Independence, 1919-1923, Michigan, 1958. Paul C. Helm Reich from Paris to Chevres, the partition of the Ottoman Empire at the Peace Conference of 1919-1920, Ohio 1974, 3-5, Der Gesimte Verein Barungstext befindet sich auf S. 341F. Patrick Balfour can Ross Ataturk, a biography of Mustafa Kemal, father of modern Turkey, New York 1965, Sir Frederick B. Morris The Armistices of 1918, London 1943.